Hi everyone, I'm Dustin, I'm Director of Innovation at View Portal and this video is just going to be a brief tour of the services available on the platform. So when people log in, the first thing they see is the user dashboard. This is really just going to highlight any outstanding incidents that are allocated to that user, any responsive actions, and anything that's outstanding on the internal audit schedule that's been assigned to them. So there can't be any uh, surprises that's been thrown around. First thing to show you is on your company profile, you can uh, add into here any of the information that you'd like to provide to your customers with approval parameters that you're going to share and you can add in all of the contact details for your site's team. You simply share your organisation ID with your customers and they can actually access your profile from the Food Portal Supplier Directory. So this is just a, a really good way of sidestepping all of the continual risk, uh, requests for updated site accreditations. So here, if the uh, customer had your organisation ID, they, they can access any of the information that you've entered into your company profile. So no more updates whenever one of your accreditations expires. Now from administration options, you can add any number of users that you need for your site, there's no restrictions on that. So coming part by part, the various functions of the few portal systems are listed up here in a navigation pane and we can do suppliers, raw materials, products, assets, incidents, process and audits. So I'll take you through these just, just in that order. Now for each supplier record you can uh, create a profile for the supplier and you upload any evidence that you want to hold for that supplier uh, just as attachments and it's all stored for, the, uh, for you on the cloud. And for any of your suppliers who use the Food Portal Supplier Directory, they can provide you with their supply, uh, their organisation ID. So you can see that in this case, it's a, a linked supplier and the example is Holter Med Company. And the approval profile for this supplier is directly managed by the supplier through their profile. So whenever they get an update to their certificate, they update it and it will be reflected in your approval systems. Uh, for all suppliers, you can have an overview of all approval parameters uh, without, um, it, it's, it's listing them all out and you can sort that list by expiry date. So it just makes it really easy to keep an eye on what's going to expire or what needs an update. Now we've left suppliers and come into raw materials. You uh, list out each raw material by its code and its description and then it can be risk assessed according to its supply route. So where you have uh, multiple suppliers for the same raw material and in, in the example here we can see we've got three instances of white flour supplied by international flower traders, the flower co and traditional millers. Um, in each instance, it can be risk assessed separately. So if I come into the approval profile for strong white flower sourced from international flower traders, you can see we've got uh, version control risk assessment and approval attachments. Now, a better example If I come into the approval profile for a whole egg powder supplied by Cracking Powders Limited, you can see that we've got a record of the supplier's product code. So when goods are received, you can check the uh, invoice or delivery note 
against the surprise product code that you have for this risk assessment to make sure that your intake parameters are aligned properly with the risk assessment and you can ha have the uh, trade route be active or inactive. Uh, you've got version controlled risk assessments and any uh, approval param uh, parameters or attachments that you'd like to associate with this supplier route supply route so that could include things like surveillance testing or where you have say kosher certified material when a certificate applies to the material specifically not just the supply site that could go here so i'll take you into the draft copy of the risk assessment and this has been designed to be quite quite familiar to anybody who's ever used a retailer specification system uh, so User, um, it, it's a very, very user friendly and intuitive. Now, this risk assessment is RM E3, that's the material code, whole leg powder, supplied by Cracking Powders Limited. So, the supplier, so the, the supplier here is the commercial entity who invoices those two, and underneath that, we can identify one or more manufacturer sites. So cracking powders could be both a supplier and a manufacturer, and the supply route could include wholesome egg company as a contingent manufacturer, uh, contingency manufacturer, or cracking powders may play no role in a manufacture of material whatsoever and act solely as a supplier for a traded good. Uh, but you can define your manufacturing route at this point. So each material can be risk assessed according to its composition and as part of the composition table each uh, item gets uh, a, a, a detailed page where you can identify countries of origin uh, through to all HARA requirements. So allergens have been presented as radio buttons just to make this quick and easy to work through. Uh, the quality attributes uh, provides the reference point for any decision making in terms of rejecting, uh, sorry, uh, rejecting a batch of uh, goods back to its supplier or uh, raising a supplier complaint, which is uh, just to get ahead of me, um, things later. So you've got the quality attributes here is designed to be a uh, detailed reference of accept and reject limits, whereas when we get into release, that's specifically um, what challenges the material would undergo at inspection, limited to that. So uh, the quality attributes, this is a reference point. Uh, you can uh, include any number of chemical parameters in your risk assessment, including uh, any units of measurement and you can attribute a different surveillance frequency to each chemical parameter. So for example, if we were talking about nut products, you might want to have quite frequent aflatoxin testing, whereas if it's um, the pesticide testing, that might only be annual. So it can be configured per parameter. And that's better expressed here where we have the microorganisms and you can see that salmonella is at a slightly increased testing frequency compared to spoilage micro. Now for dietary attributes, you can put any number of assurance or com compliance schemes here. In the example, we're using CAT and the material is certified status. And whenever you add something here, you get a details page for each assurance scheme. And here you can include details regarding the governing body where appropriate. And in the case of schemes such as RSPO, you can include the material category and certification number uh, in these blank fields. So it's designed to be flexible enough to, uh, to cover any assurance scheme. 
the uh, nutritional tab is simply a reference point for you to be able to record that information. And at the vulnerability assessment, it's uh, loosely based around the BRCGS version 8 requirements for the vulnerability assessment uh, to, to fraud. And for each parameter, you have a multiple selection of low, medium, through high risk responses. And ultimately, you can uh, define the outcome of the vulnerability assessment and whether or not the vulnerability of the material necessitates analytical testing for fraud mitigation uh, and you've got a free text field for further details that are particular to this material. Now as I alluded to just a few moments ago uh, the release section is a specific series of challenges that uh, the material should undergo for release from goods intake into warehouse as, as accepted stock. So uh, here, for example, we've included a package integrity inspection saying that the paper sacks must be clean and undamaged. So in contrast to the quality attributes page, which was a detailed reference point for accept and reject levels and, uh, and, and would accommodate for much more detailed descriptions, uh, the release criteria is a set of instructions for your intake staff. Uh, your packaging uh, risk assessment is really just allowing you to record your packaging formats, uh, which would include any number of layers on your layer table. This is also where you would record whether the, uh, whether the packaging that the raw material arrives in is staple free. And at authorization, it's just uh, this is the version control for the entirety of the raw material risk assessment. And coming back into the original uh, approval profile for the uh, for the egg powder, I can show you that as you progress any version from draft to active. Uh, it automatically results in the um, generation of a new draft copy, which carries through all of the existing risk assessment information. But the uh, version controlled copies in your uh, in, in your history of revisions will present that information as a as a record. So you can always have absolute confidence in the version control as it applies to your raw material risk assessments. Now, for site controls, the various uh, control documents that you might want to produce are listed out with their history of revisions. And I'll take you into the draft copy of the approved list for purchasing. So to demonstrate, here we have version number 40 and it's at draft status. And what's happening is it's populating this from the individual risk assessments that have been carried out on each supply route. So here, here is populating supplier and manufacturers for each supply route. And you can see if we've got uh, one supply route using multiple manufacturer sites, that's how it's expressed. And it's subject itself to version control. So you can make updates to a draft copy of a risk assessment without any unintended updates to the active copy of the risk assessment. And in much the same way, once a risk assessment becomes active, the draft copy of the site control document will be updated to reflect the active version of the risk assessment. Uh, so you can, you can do all of those things without concern about unintended updates to your uh, to your site control documents so you can update your risk assessments independently of that. So coming into raw material uh, acceptance criteria I'll take you to the active copy of this controlled document 
firstly to demonstrate that from the point where it's been activated, the, uh, the, the, the version history information is properly recorded. And secondly, you can generate a PDF to download from this uh, version, uh, from your version history. And you can see that the PDF includes the version number as well as the uh, revision history and the, uh, the reasons for update. And you can draw through all of the uh, acceptance criteria as a reference document for your intake function. And it can slot it into your existing QMS. So whatever document control system you're currently using, this would be able to be added into that with no disruption. So for products, it's very similar. You can add a product in using its code and description. When you do that, a uh, product record is automatically generated. So there's, uh, the, this system is quite streamlined in that way. Similarly to uh, the way the raw material risk assessments were set up, you can see there's a version control specification and the facility to associate any number of attachments with that. If I take you into the draft copy of the uh, specification, very familiar site, and the advantage of having that compatibility of uh, product specification to raw material risk assessment is you can provide your customers with the, uh, the product ID for any of your products and when they go to raw materials, they can actually add in a new risk assessment based on the product that you provided them with. So I, you saw I've just picked up my own product and for demonstration I'll say yes, I'd like to connect this up into my, my raw material risk assessment. And for, for, for demonstration purposes, I don't have a match for that particular description, but we'll say cake flour and here's the product code and you can see that I would have connected up the product specification that I received with a raw material uh, that I have on my list of raw materials. And because I've got all of these uh, set up for demonstration purposes already, let's look at pasteurized liquid egg from Wholesome Egg Company. The approval profile is generated from that product link and we get the specification from the supplier. So I'll uh, quickly hop into that and, and you can see that uh, we have the specification provided to us and, and that's from the supplier's records. And in addition to that, if we go into the draft copy of the risk assessment, you can see that it's, it's informing me the information on this page of the risk assessment is reflective of the active version of the supplier's product specification. And that's because it's been populated already. So if we were to go to the allergen section, you can see I, I don't need to enter this information, it's just drawn through. And so when I go to my site controls, I can look at the allergen risk assessment for the site with the risk assessment for that liquid egg being automatically fed in to my site control document. So the reason that's such an enormous advantage is um, for any for any food business that participates in the food portal supplier directory they can all generate product specifications there and so the potential to link up the supply chain with information that's directly generated by the manufacturer of the material on behalf of any of the customers that use that material uh, that, 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 that there's um, there's a lot of uh, 
streamlining in terms of the information flow across the supply chain that we can achieve with this. So with areas and zones, this is principally for trending purposes when it comes to recording incidents, etc. Uh, you can add in anything and you can go as far as your goods receipt area or the waste disposal area. So it doesn't just have to be limited to manufacturing zones. Uh, with production lines, you can associate particular production lines with the areas and zones that you input here. So if you've got multiple production lines located in the same building, uh, it can all be uh, dealt with in that way. So with raw material bulk containers, we're talking about things like silos and tanks uh, for storing and receiving raw materials. And this is principally for traceability purposes. So if we say here I've entered silo one, I get the loading history automatically populated for this bulk container. And that's as a result of uh, the intake records that process are linked directly with the records for this bulk container. So the incident system on Food Portal is designed to record any type of quality incident that your quality management system might want to take note of. And it's all driven through the source of event information. So it, you might raise an incident as a result of a customer complaint, or it could be from process. And if it is, you can categorize it as being a behavioral problem or uh, a fault to do with equipment. and there, for example, the equipment could be blade or sharps control or there's a maintenance need identified somewhere. Uh, and this means that you've got a completely adaptive form for recording any type of quality issue as it arises. And you don't need to be in a particular, you know, you, know, you don't need to be in the office to be able to populate this. Anybody could uh, enter information from their smartphone or a mobile device. So you've got a, a really uh, good opportunity to take all of your operational uh, per performance issues and collate them into a single trendable database. And if I take a look at an example incident, this one is uh, raised as a result of a customer complaint. So if we say small piece of blue plastic in a roll, you can see uh, we have associated the material, which is any raw materials or products that you've entered into the system will be available to select from the drop down list. And uh, the same goes for your areas and production lines. As you raise this type of, well, any type of incident, it's automatically uh, categorized as being proactive or reactive. And that's uh, uh, as a result of the combination of the source of event information and its categories. And uh, you won't need to manually do that, but if you ever feel like the categorization is wrong, you, you do have the ability to overrule it. Now, for every incident that's recorded, you can take note of the immediate actions taken and uh, assign a status. Every incident will have an owner, so in this case, we'll associate it with this demonstration account. Uh, and for every incident, you can identify an unlimited number of contributing factors. So I think we're all quite familiar with the root cause categorization throughout the industry, which generally only associates a single root cause with an investigation, but with the incident system, it's completely open-ended, so you can categorize contributing factors. Uh, you can use free text to give it its unique description, and for trending purposes, it's all available to select from a drop-down list. And for responsive actions, every time you've had one of these uh, contributing factors go into the list, it becomes available to select 
and you can associate an unlimited number of corrective or preventative actions to it. And with each of them, you can associate responsibility to a different individual and record evidence of it having been closed out on a particular date. Now, just by, uh, by virtue of the fact that having entered all of the incident information and closed them out using this system, trending is automated. So there is, there is zero administration work that is required from you to have these graphical outputs. And here, because of the categorization of incidents being either proactively raised or reactively raised, you can see for the purposes of your food safety and quality culture measurement, over a particular time period, the ratio of proactively or reactively raised incidents. So you can really say definitively what the performance is on that metric for your site's food safety and quality behaviour. Now, for the sort of event information, this is a really good opportunity to uh, identify your most significant KPIs for your business. So when talking about quality performance metrics, a lot of people will immediately think that customer complaints are the most significant performance metric. But um, really, if you've got your quality system working optimally, you'd hope to be raising a lot more of your quality feedback information from, say, internal audits and scheduled inspections. So this really helps you to identify where your most significant KPIs are and where to focus that attention. With the uh, categorization of incidents going against areas and zones and production lines that have been uh, identified as assets, you can trend against frequent occurrence of any type of incident uh, against those areas and production lines. Customer complaints as they're uh, categorised, you can look at customer complaints that have been associated with the delivery condition of the material, the product quality, and finally, any customer complaints that you can attribute to a raw material or supplier fault. And the reason that's in there is uh, uh, you you might have say if you're a chicken manufacturer uh, if you're making chicken pies and the manufacturer of the chicken uh, gave you some material that, that resulted in a customer complaint because of a bone you'd be able to say that particular customer complaint because of the nature of the complaint it's so obviously identifiable with bone and the chicken supplier. You, you can associate it in that way and people find that quite, uh, it, it's useful in terms of are your complaints arising from a particular systemic source. Now when it comes to the subcategory for customer complaints, you can say uh, I want to see a breakdown of the product quality complaints and it will just lay them out for you on that second graph. So it's quite uh, it, it, you can drill down into the recurring nature of the categorization of the complaints for the products. Now, all of these um, uh, subsequent graphs work in the same sort of way. You get a categorization and a subcategorization. So here, for example, if I say I want to know about the different incidents raised that are due to contamination being detected, it's saying, well, we have metal, plastic, and other as the, as the subcategorization. So with that having been demonstrated, I'll proceed to the bottom. And here, because we don't just have one single root cause for each incident that arises, but we have uh, a multitude of contributing factors, you can see that you've got a wealth of uh, data that's being accumulated by the quality management system. And for the purposes of food safety and quality culture measurement, you can remove from the graph everything uh, that's not associated with cultural factors. So let's say uh, insufficient resource, mis 
mismanagement, we'll keep that one in. Defective procedure is more procedural and systematic, we'll take out other. Uh, Right, so um, here, for example, having taken out all of the factors that we don't think are directly associated with culture or behavior or attitude, uh, we, we, you would be able to say, do you have a recurring feature in, in your quality management system that's rooted in cultural uh, stances and how could you address that in a very targeted way? Uh, with preventative and corrective actions, because you can add an unlimited number of each to each contributing factor, you can use this as another performance metric for your food safety and quality culture using the ratio of preventative versus corrective actions over a given time period as an indicator of your food safety and quality behaviour for your site. So the process and traceability section on Food Portal will cover everything from recording purchase orders through to allocation of customer, uh, sorry, allocation of batches of finished products to a customer order. And if I dip into this uh, purchase order that's been put aside for Mexican honey from B Sweets, you can see that for every purchase order you raise, no assumption is made about whether it's all going to be called off in a single hit or whether it's going to be a contract purchase over a course of a year or so with multiple call-offs. But every time you add a call-off to a purchase order, it's reflected in your site's delivery schedule. And when I go to the intake record for any delivery, you can see that the first thing uh, it's feeding in information from the raw material risk assessment for that material and uh, this, this isn't a great example because I've not populated the, the honey raw material risk assessment with intake inspection uh, challenges but you can see that it's showing us now the uh, microbiological risk assessment information and chemical parameters which is actually reflective of fraud mitigation uh, for, for the honey in this case. Now for each uh, delivery of raw material you can record a load of intake information particular to the delivery vehicle and you might have multiple batches of a raw material on the same delivery and you can record that in this form. Uh, in, the, in the case of bulk containers where we were looking earlier it would be as simple as selecting that bulk container from a list on a drop down for every batch of uh, material received uh, against that bulk container to be properly associated. And for attachments, you can upload any number of attachments uh, to be associated with a particular batch of raw material. And by using the chain share function, that would ultimately determine whether at a later point in, in, in the process uh, the attachments could be shared with your customers or whether they would stay private to your site. Uh, just to help with planning and availability, the available raw material batches shows batches of raw materials that have been received and have a quantity of greater than zero. Uh, every time a batch of raw material is associated with a works order, the available uh, quantity is deducted from to maintain accurate records. Now for works orders, you can uh, record a works order against a product with the planned date and shift. And if I go into uh, details and batches for this works order, you can see that, I mean, this is only demonstration data, but you can see that we can associate raw material batches that would be deducted from the available batches of raw materials 
and you, they then become the input materials consumed for the raw materials, uh, sorry, for the works order, and the total quantity of material into the works order is calculated out as being both uh, kilograms or pounds. So as you're allocating uh, quantities in, you don't need to stay on a metric system if you if you if you don't want to. And the output batch from uh, from a works order will appear in this table with calculations that play that prevent the total quantity of output material from exceeding the total quantity of input material. So it's rationalised to prevent that. So for every output batch that comes from a works order, they'll appear in the product release table. Uh, if I go into the product batch details for this thread roll, you will see that it's very similar in its uh, presentation to the raw material intake record, but it's referencing information from the product specification and has the ability to uh, determine whether the product batch is QC passed. If it is, it can be associated with customers' orders, and if it's not, then it won't be able to be selected as a, a, a allocation. And similarly to raw material batches, a finished product batch can have an unlimited number of attachments associated with it. And you've got the chain share feature so that if that were selected, the attachments here would ultimately be provided to any customers that have this batch of finished products allocated to their order. And if it's not selected, then it will be private to your site. And the available product batch table is really uh, to help out uh, sales order processing and planning functions. So where you have stock of finished product yet to be allocated, but have uh, passed QC on the release. Now, by allocating uh, material to customers, the allocation records are maintained automatically, and for each, you get a product release link. So, at the point at which a customer order, uh, sorry, a batch of product is allocated to a customer order, an email is automatically sent to that customer with this link, so that any uh, attachments associated with the finished product are automatically available to that customer so you can cut out any um, having to send COAs to customers by QC after sales order processing. That process can just be automated away with this. Um, particularly helpful if you have large batches of finished product that are being allocated to numerous customer orders. Uh, you, the customer is provided with a summary of the traceability details and as fraud mitigation, the customer is provided with the intake records determining the quantity recorded for raw material batches consumed by the works order that this finished product came from. But in addition, if you use the chain share function to attach evidence that that quantity was in fact recorded, this allows you to provide assurance to customers for every consignment that the, uh, the batch of product that you allocated to them had all of its raw materials drawn from a positive stock pool and it's evidenced uh, and safeguarded you can't over allocate uh, into works orders from raw materials because the, the accounting won't, won't allow that. So uh, th there's a lot of assurance delivered to your customers in an automated way.
Now coming in to audits, uh, along the bottom bar on this navigation pane, you can see it goes uh, kind of in reverse order to the way that you would want it when you're initially setting it up, but it's presented in the order that you'll most frequently use it in during use. So I'll start an audit team. And you can see that you have the ability to define your internal auditing team and upload evidence of training and competency. Now, through Portal, when you uh, get your membership, it's preloaded with the uh, BRTGS version 8 food standard with all of the clauses in there. Uh, just by way of example, this is the uh, section to pass it content. Uh, but you can see that for any, uh, for, for all of your audits, you can add in additional custom audits. So it's completely flexible and uh, any, any additional compliance standards that you have, you would, you would have the freedom to enter in the audit details at this point. So with your internal audit risk assessment, every audit can be risk assessed for frequency based on the risk associated with the activity and we're having uh, high, do, high, medium and low risk outcomes there and the previous audit performance you might have found robust compliance or you could have identified serious risks which ultimately gives you an audit frequency for your systems audit of once through three times per year. So having gone through those steps, internal audits can be selected from a drop down uh, and the only internal audits that you'll see here are the ones that have been risk assessed for their audit frequency. You can choose the auditor and select the plan date from a calendar and when you come into the audit schedule itself, the audit can be directly accessed at that point. So here we, you've got the planned date versus the date completed and for each clause that you're going to audit against, you simply select the clause. Having done that, it shows you the auditing requirement and you can record either conformity or non-conformity with a description of the observation. So for any non-conformity that you find, it will be added into this table. And for any evidence of conformity, it will be added into this table and you can navigate through and associate an unlimited number of attachments for objective evidence. Uh, with the non-conformities, it's immediately integrated with the incident management system. So you could be out uh, auditing in the factory and find non-compliance and from your mobile phone, navigate directly into that uh, detail for the non-conformity and associate evidence which would be uh, retrieved immediately from your camera phone. So you can do an entire factory audit without and um, it, it, it's completely from a mobile device on the food portal system. So you, you can have a complete factory audit conducted and fully written up before you get back to the office. So that's the food portal system.